should be up and running here. So good morning again. Uh, my name is Dallas Carpenter. I'm the communications manager for the Saskatchewan Wheat Development Commission. Uh, today we will be listening to a presentation on phosphorus and micronutrient fertility for wheat. Uh, we will have a limited amount of time at the end of the presentation for questions. Uh, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen or raise your hands and I will try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, I'd just like to uh, mention that, uh, so we were working on CEU credits for this. Uh, we don't have approval for that just yet, but keep checking back and uh, to our website or email me and uh, we will try to get that information out to you as soon as possible. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Jeff Shano who is a professor of soil fertility and professional agrologist who works in the Department of Soil Sciences at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Jeff was born in Saskatchewan and completed his undergraduate and graduate degrees at the uh, College of Agriculture at the U of S. Uh, his research, teaching, and extension activities deal with soil fertility and fertilizer management, conservation, and nutrient dynamics. He owns and operates a grain farm with his wife, Lynn, near Central Butte in South Central Saskatchewan. And with that, Jeff, please take it away. Okay, thanks. I'll just start my video here. You can turn that on, Dallas. It says I cannot start the video because the host has stopped it, but... Okay. But that's all right. If we can't get video, that's no problem. I will move on to my sharing my screen. Okay, just give me a second here. Can you see my screen, Dallas? Yes, you bet. Please Can you turn on my video or do uh, I need... Yeah, I'm, I'm working on that here. I'm not sure what's going on. That's, o that's okay. We can run it without, without video. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Dallas. So what I want to do in the next uh, a few minutes here is to talk to you folks a little bit about phosphorus and micronutrient fertility management, specifically for wheat. So I'm gonna be sharing some of our research findings uh, related to those specific topics over the next, uh, next few minutes. So we'll start out first with phosphorus in soil. Of course, we recognize that phosphorus is an essential macronutrient for plants. Uh, it's involved in, in reproduction, very important in root growth, and it's really the energy currency of, of life. And crops really rely on, on, on critically on a sufficient supply of plant available phosphorus in the soil. And especially for the annual crops that we grow here on the prairies, they need especially an early supply of available phosphorus to allow them to carry out the very important functions of growth, the cell division uh, associated with seedling growth uh, uh, early on in their life cycle. Uh, so in fact, uh, in here in, on the prairies, about 50% of the Phosphorus uptake by the plant uh, over its growth cycle, in fact, takes place typically by the time less than 25% of the dry matter has been produced. So it needs that phosphorus uh, early on. Very good. Okay, I think we're up and going now. Great. Thank you very much, Dallas. <laughs> And the other thing about phosphorus is, is we know that phosphorus is relatively immobile in the soil. That is to say it'll only move a, a few millimeters or a couple of centimeters from where it's placed. To get to those roots, it needs to move by diffusion uh, through the soil water. Uh, and that occurs over only fairly short distances that that, uh, that, that uh, uh, movement can occur. So that really becomes important when it comes to considerations of phosphorus placement, which we'll talk about a little bit as well. Uh, that's the phosphorus cycle, and, and sometimes that can be a, a bit overwhelming, but, but actually it's pretty simple. Uh, we have a soluble phosphorus there in the form of phosphate ions in the soil water. The plant takes up that. That's the form that the roots can, can directly absorb. And that phosphate in solution gets replaced over time by release from minerals in the soil and also through release from organic compounds through the action of microbial uh, organisms in the soil. And also those same uh, factors, those fractures 
fractions out there in the soil like minerals and, and, and microbes can also temporarily reduce the availability through processes like immobilization and sorption. And what that really means is that in our prairie soils, typically there isn't enough soluble phosphate supplied by these different fractions over the season. So as a consequent, we, consequence, we need to meet that de uh, deficit through the application of fertilizer phosphorus. And when it comes to fertilizer phosphorus management, of course, those four R nutrient stewardship principles that we hear lots about certainly apply to phosphorus. That is the right place, the right time, the right source and the right rate are really what's required to make it work. And of course, those are all interrelated. And as I said, phosphorus placement strategy is very important because of the immobility of phosphorus in the soil and the need to have that phosphorus available to the crop early on in its growth cycle. And because of that immobil immobility, we need to have that phosphorus placed close to where the roots of that germinating seedling are gonna be able to access it, as in the seed row or in a sideband type of placement or a paired row type of placement, uh, really uh, having it there in the soil and getting it in the ground. And that getting it in the ground is important because surface placement without incorporation reduces crop recovery because that phosphorus gets hung up on the surface. It's too far away to move to roots and it also increases losses of that phosphate in runoff water, which poses environmental issues related to water quality. So phosphorus placement is very important. And as I've stressed, having that phosphorus in the seed row or close by at the time of seeding really enables that early root access to that phosphorus and promotes uh, increased early season growth and vigor as shown there in one of our trials there with hard red spring wheat. No phosphorus versus 40 kilograms of P2O5 per hectare, kilograms per hectare, pounds per acre, about the same thing. So 40 pounds per acre of uh, P2O5 as monoammonium phosphate there uh, in the seed row there showing that uh, very pronounced uh, uh, increased early uh, plant growth, uh, bigger plants, uh, uh, longer leaves, uh, that, that increased uh, vigor and, 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 and growth that we sometimes refer to as the, as the pop-up effect and, and starter effect of that, uh, of that uh, early season phosphorus uh, uh, available when we, when we put it in the seed row or close by. I think another depiction of the importance of that is shown in some of our other work where we looked at crop response to a small amount of phosphorus, 20 kilograms of P2O5 per hectare, applied on a phosphorus deficient soil and looking at how the crops that we evaluated, canola, wheat and pea, responded to that small amount of phosphorus, applied all with the seed at the time of seeding, in a split application where 10 kilograms was put in the seed row and the other 10 was applied as a foliar application mid season. And finally, uh, an application where all of that phosphorus, the whole 20 kilograms of P2O5 per hectare was applied as a mid season foliar application. And what we can see here folks, uh, for canola in the blue, but also observed for the wheat as well, the black bars, we got the best response where we had all of that phosphorus in the seed row. Where we tried to put uh, a significant amount, half of that phosphorus in a split application, we didn't get as good response. And where we tried to get it all through the leaves, we got some yield benefit in the canola and also maybe a little bit there in the wheat, but certainly there is a limit to how much phosphorus you can get through the foliage. And this really shows the importance of having phosphorus in the soil available for that uptake by that seedling uh, early on uh, to enable it to carry out its, its, its physiological processes. And that really, uh, while foliar applications of phosphorus can be effectively used as a top up, they really aren't a substitute for having some phosphorus placed in the soil at the time of seeding for that, that early, early access. So some uptake of foliar applied we saw in our study at mid season, but that reduced yield response as the proportion is increased relative to the application in soil for that small amount of B added uh, really uh, reflects a limited capacity for uptake of phosphorus through the foliage and its best use as a top up. The other thing in terms of yield response that we saw, canola tended to respond the greatest to the phosphorus application, followed by wheat and pea. We didn't see big responses, probably reflecting the ability of the pea to be a pretty good scavenger for indigenous phosphorus in that soil. 
The other thing that comes up, of course, if we're talking about putting phosphorus fertilizer right in the seed row, is we do need to recognize that there is a limit. And uh, sensitivity to pea fertilizer in the seed row is an important consideration, depending on what crop you're growing. Uh, we have different maximum allowable seed placed rates. This is some results of a study that we did with uh, monoammonium phosphate, in this case it was 1251, that we put in the seed row, about a 15% seed bed utilization in this study here, uh, showing that uh, in the case of wheat, we could go up to about 40 pounds of P2O5 per acre or 40 kilograms of P2O5 per hectare, about pretty similar uh, kilograms per hectare, pounds per acre, uh, without any significant uh, reduction in the uh, uh, emergence of the wheat. Once we got up to 60 and 80, we started to see some significant declines in emergence. And when we also had some potash in there, some KCL, then the amount of phosphorus that we could put along with it uh, consequently uh, decreased. Uh, Canola, more sensitive to uh, uh, fertilizer in the seed row, more sensitive to that salt effect. And in this evaluation that we did, we found peas to be a very sensitive crop to uh, fertilizer injury from, from injury from, from too much fertilizer in the, in the seed row is shown there where, where only a small amount of phosphorus could be, could be put down in the seed row before we ended up with some significant reductions in, in emergence. But wheat, uh, cereals in general, are pretty tolerant to a seed row placed phosphorus fertilizer with a, a maximum safe rate around 40 uh, uh, pounds of P2O5 per acre for the, for the uh, cereals like wheat. Uh, moving on to another aspect of, of, of uh, phosphorus management and nutrient management in general is uh, uh, paying attention to your, to your weed control. And this is a study here where we looked at how wild oats competed with uh, nutrients for uh, cereal crops. And uh, this was a study where we had kind of a moderate wild oat infestation, and we looked at the uptake of nitrogen and phosphorus by those wild oats uh, over time, all the way up to 10 weeks of age. And you can see there, folks, a lot of uptake of, of nitrogen and phosphorus takes place early on. By the time those wild oats were two months old, we had over 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre in those, uh, 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 in that taken up by those wild oats and over 20 pounds of P2O5 per acre. So early control of those wild oats is important to reduce competition for nutrient, as well as other things like light and water that we know weeds end up robbing uh, from that crop and causing uh, a yield depression. The other thing that we were interested in is how does the timing of control of those wild oats affect the release of nutrient from those residues and the ability of the crop to actually utilize it. And so uh, where we terminated the wild oats at different growth stages here, all the way from one weeks up to 10 weeks, uh, when we terminated the wild oats at one week, uh, we were able to get some nitrogen released from that wild oat residue and utilized by the wheat plants it was growing with. Uh, but not a whole lot. Even one week, uh, we didn't get a whole lot back. We did, however, get a significant amount of phosphorus released and made available to that accompanying wheat crop when we terminated those wild oats early on. But however, just like for nitrogen, as those wild oats got older and older, less and less of that nutrient got released and uh, became potentially available for the accompanying crop to, uh, to use. So what this really shows is that early wild oat control is, is important to reduce competition with that wheat crop for the nutrients to begin with. And also that that early wild oat control will also promote more, re -rapid, more rapid recycling of that nutrient back into available forms for the crop to use that, uh, that year. So uh, showing the benefits of that, 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 that early control on, uh, on enhancing the availability of nutrient, uh, uh, nitrogen, but in particular phosphorus. I want to talk a little bit about phosphorus fertilizer sources. Uh, here on the prairies, we have different phosphorus fertilizer sources available. Uh, Monoammonium phosphate or MAP, like 1152 or 1251, uh, most common, but we have others certainly. Ammonium phosphate sulfur. We have liquid phosphorus forms like ammonium polyphosphates. We have uh, organic forms. Another source that uh, has come on stream is one that's called struvite. And that is a magnesium ammonium phosphate. And it's produced by recycling phosphorus out of wastewater streams. 
And so we were interested in how the struvite compared to monoammonium phosphate as a phosphorus source. And so a graduate student who worked with me, uh, Ming Zhao Xiao, who just completed his master's thesis uh, uh, in, in January and defended it, uh, did a study. Uh, comparison of monoammonium phosphate and struvite. This was done in the growth chamber, the Phytotron in the U of S. Uh, we worked with a phosphorus deficient brown turnozem. And the treatments that we had is we had monoammonium phosphate and the struvite source, crystal green, 5280 with 10% magnesium, added at uh, four rates in the same furrow as the seed. And in this study, we also had two different opener spreads, a one inch opener spread and a three inch opener spread. We grew canola to which we added the fertilizer treatments. And then this was followed by wheat and pea without any fertilizer to take a look at the residual effect. So we looked at the 30 day above ground biomass yield, the phosphorus uptake and the recovery of the added fertilizer pea. What we found in this study, looking first at phosphorus fertilizer rate effect on the biomass uh, of, of the crops. Uh, in this case, we can see showing here the biomass at the different rates that we added to the canola and the residual effect on the wheat and the pea. We saw a significant yield response of the canola to application of that uh, uh, fertilizer, uh, maximized around 40 kilograms of P2O5 per hectare. Interestingly, we also saw a significant response of the wheat to the residual phosphorus that was left behind after the canola crop was growing. The peas, we didn't see much response at all. Again, reflecting the fact that peas are pretty good phosphorus scavengers and probably were able to use the indigenous phosphorus in the soil uh, quite effectively. In comparison of mat versus struvite and its effect on crop biomass and phosphorus uptake, the biomass in blue and the effect on phosphorus uptake in pink, we can see that for the canola, there was very little difference in between monoammonium phosphate and struvite on the biomass yield or on the phosphorus uptake, pretty much equally effective. In the wheat crop that was grown uh, following, the, uh, following the canola, uh, we saw in fact a, a small but actually significantly, a slight, a slight but, but statistically significantly better uh, yield on the struvite compared to the monoammonium phosphate, whereas the pho phosphorus uptake on the struvite was slightly lower than the map. But overall, no big differences for the, for the following wheat crop or for the pea that was grown after the wheat, indicating the struvite to be an effective phosphorus source, similar in, 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 in uh, uh, responses to the monoammonium phosphate in this particular uh, controlled environment study. We also looked at opener spread, one inch versus three inch opener spread. And here we found that the narrower opener spread, the one inch opener spread, gave us slightly better phosphorus uptake and recovery compared to the three inch and slightly better yield for the canola and also for the wheat yield. Not much difference in pea uptake there and really no effect on the, on the pea. And so what we're seeing there, I think, is a small effect uh, in the, the narrower opener because of reduced contact between the fertilizer and the soil constituents that fix that pea fertilizer and take it out of solution like those, those minerals. That, that narrower opener, which reduces soil fertilizer contact, gives slightly greater phosphorus availability and greater phosphorus uptake. It's not a huge effect, however. We could see it under the controlled environments of the growth chamber, but out in the field when we looked at this, uh, we didn't see as big or consistent effect. It was a, a lot much harder to, 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 to detect that, that effect in, in some field studies that we followed up on the effect of the, of the opener spread and the seedbed utilization. So that's a look at phosphorus. I wanna move on next to micronutrients. Micronutrients in wheat, well, they are elements that are required in very small amount, but, but certainly still essential. They're no less important in plant nutrition than the macronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or sulfur. Now here in Western Canada, folks, the micronutrients of, of interest uh, are, are copper, zinc, boron, manganese, iron, and chlorine. And for cereals like wheat, uh, copper, zinc, 
and chlorine are the micronutrients that we would be, be most interested in because those are the, are the nutrients that we have the greatest micros that we have the greatest potential to, 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 to see a, a response to uh, their fertilization. So I'm gonna emphasize the copper, the zinc, and the, and the chlorine as micros of interest for, for wheat nutrition and fertility. And I guess when we think about micronutrients, I always like to think of, of micronutrients that, that, that they're kind of mysterious by nature. I guess you might say for, for lack of a better term, they're, they're kind of ghostly. Uh, ghostly in the sense that, that, that the deficiencies sometimes appear and then disappear. And the symptoms are also often easily confused with, with other forms of, of plant stress. And that makes it, it, it difficult to, to, to conclusively diagnose a, a deficiency sometimes without uh, multiple evidence, uh, not just relying on visual symptoms, but also a soil test, a tissue test to, to conclusively, more conclusively identify if a limitation exists. And oftentimes it requires a, a unique combination of soil, environmental, and crop conditions for that deficiency to show up. And the kinds of conditions that, 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 that come together to manifest that, that the, and create that deficiency are often quite, quite complex. And because of that, they're difficult to predict as well. And that's kind of just the nature of the beast, folks. And, and because of that as well, the responses that we see are, are often small, fleeting and variable and, and can sometimes uh, uh, make it make it rather rather difficult to to, to be conclusive in, in both diagnosis and the prediction of a, of a response. And from a research standpoint, often makes it difficult in experimentation to consistently show statistically significant uh, uh, responses. A bit of physiology behind micronutrients, what they do in crop nutrition, uh, the micronutrient metals like copper, zinc, manganese, and iron, they're involved in a number of important processes in the plant like photosynthesis, enzyme activate, activation, hormonal functions. Uh, some of these micronutrients also play roles in disease resistance. And a good example of that related to wheat is copper deficiency. And copper deficiency may aggravate ergot infections in wheat because the copper deficiency causes the floor to remain open longer, which increases the susceptibility to infection. And as a result, research work that's been done, and particularly thinking of work that was done in the past in Alberta in particular, show that copper fertilization could be helpful to reduce the incidence of ergot on a copper deficient soil. And kind of related to this is a good time to talk a little bit about chloride and its role in, in nutrition. Uh, it's involved in charge balances, osmotic or water relationships, cell turgor, but it's also been shown to play uh, some role in resistance to root diseases, like take all root rot, rot for example, and leaf diseases, especially in cereals like uh, barley, wheat, uh, especially winter wheat. And uh, this uh, figure here shows uh, the effect of, of adding chloride on a uh, chloride deficient soil on reducing the incidence of leaf spot in, in, in winter wheat, showing how that chloride reduces that, uh, reduce that, that leaf spot in this particular instance. Uh, when it comes to deficiency symptoms and micronutrients, uh, deficiency symptoms uh, uh, can be a good first clue, but, but beware, uh, there can be a lot of other things that, that produce uh, symptoms similar to the deficiency symptoms produced by micronutrients. But I do have to say when it comes to copper deficiency and copper deficiency in cereals, it produces some quite characteristic symptoms of deficiency, like this twisting or pigtailing of the leaf tips as shown here in wheat, and also in some canary seed growing on a copper deficient soil. Uh, this is copper deficiency in wheat uh, here growing again on a copper deficient soil, showing those uh, pinched leaf tips, but also showing this kind of wilted look, like it's suffering from, uh, from uh, uh, moisture stress. And that can also be a, a symptom of copper deficiency as well, this kind of withered, wilted look uh, in, your, in your cereal crop. Um, we did a study looking at uh, copper responses on, on, a, on wheat uh, a few years back, and this is hard red spring wheat on a sandy, copper deficient uh, gray luvisol. Oftentimes we see these deficiencies of micronutrients uh, manifested first and worst on, on some of the, of the sandy 
textured, high pH soils, especially in that northern agricultural fringe on the, uh, in, the, in the gray soil climatic zone. And showing here the wheat without any copper, you see that, uh, that uh, twisted uh, pinched off leaf tips. Also the heads here, uh, empty heads. Uh, whereas where we added the copper fertilizer, either a soil applied copper sulfate or as a soil applied chelate or a foliar chelate that was applied, I think in this case it was applied around the flag leaf stage, uh, we see a, a very good response to that copper fertilization. Now we see nice big full heads, none of those pinched leaves on there, uh, and significantly uh, enhanced growth and, and yield. Zinc deficiency in wheat may arise and particularly high pH soils, uh, calcareous soils like eroded knolls are places to look for, for zinc deficiency in cereal crops like wheat. And I put this picture in here. This was at uh, one of the Ministry of Agriculture's crop diagnostic schools. Everything around here is green. <laughs> the zinc deficient wheat here shows up very nicely because it has that yellowish, that chlorosis appearing, especially if you got up close and looked at it, in between the veins of the uh, of, of of the veins in the in, on the leaves of the of the wheat, so uh, that kind of yellowing intervenal chlorosis. Sometimes the the leaves leaves will look smaller. Uh, that's a, a symptoms of of zinc deficiency uh, in cereals like wheat. And I want to talk a little bit about responses that we've observed to micronutrient fertilization and that have been reported in the literature. And I guess when it comes to micronutrients, copper, I would say, is the element most likely to arise as a limitation in Saskatchewan, especially on the western side of the province and moving into Alberta, where uh, the copper deficiency tends to be, 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 be more common. And cereals, uh, especially wheat, are the crops that are, are most susceptible. Uh, we see again here in this example that pinching of those uh, leaf tips, twisting, uh, pigtailing, and also empty heads. Um, that's not to say that you may not see a, a, a copper deficiency in, in, in other types of, uh, of, of regions. Uh, this is in a gray luvisol in the east central part of Saskatchewan, a sandy gray luvisol near Porcupine Plain, some work that was done by Dr. Molly and his crew at Melford Agriculture Agri-Food Canada a few years back. In this case here, uh, showing a, a significant response to copper that was applied as a foliar application at the flag leaf stage. And in this particular example, didn't get a lot of response to a soil applied uh, a copper. And that may have been because of fixation of that copper by carbonate minerals in the soil. Uh, some other work uh, conducted around the same time uh, by Pat Flayton in her master's project also found foliar application to be more effective for a correction of copper deficiency in the year of application. However, recognize that because of the lower application rates that are typically applied in a foliar application, there often isn't much residual carryover effect into a following crop compared to higher rates that are, are soil applied. And we've observed this in our research work uh, uh, as well. And uh, some of the research work that we've been doing, and, and this is Dr. Ryan Hanks, my uh, research associate, uh, uh, who was uh, working with copper, zinc, and boron in a wheat pea canola rotation. And he saw responses to copper fertilization of wheat, as I'll show you in a moment, but also showed that some of those beneficial effects of copper also carried over into the following pea crop as, as well. Uh, what in, we did in this study uh, went out and collected soils from across Western Canada, uh, where some of these soils where we suspected would have a good chance of, of showing response to micronutrient fertilization uh, based on the soil availability assessments and also the properties, the texture, uh, the pH and so on. So these soils collected out of the field, uh, they were processed. We had lots of soil there that we were able to use in uh, a poly house uh, uh, studies. And this is the response that we saw of wheat to copper fertilization on 12 mineral soils uh, that we had sampled that we suspected would be potentially responsive to copper fertilization. And indeed they were. As shown here compared to the control, uh, we, we saw a response to uh, foliar applications of both chelated copper as, where, as well as copper sulfate. Uh, interestingly, 
we had a treatment of banded chelated copper at a fairly high rate, I think two pounds per acre of actual copper. And I think maybe what we were seeing here was some toxicity and uh, our rates uh, in retrospect should have been, been lower than, than that. Uh, and we also saw here though a good response, a positive response to soil applied banded copper sulfate. So some pretty good responses there uh, on those soils which, uh, which had low indication of copper uh, extractable and supply rates of, of copper in the soil and also had the kinds of conditions, uh, 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 sandy texture, high pH, where you might expect as well to see that uh, response to added copper. So you kind of also need to know where to look. There are certain soil conditions like high pH, calcareous, sandy texture, which are particularly conducive to creating a micronutrient deficiency in the soil. This is another glasshouse study that we did that we uh, recently published, and this was with the soil from southwestern Saskatchewan, the Scepter area, a uh, uh, heavy clay, uh, and we had actually quite high extractable levels of, of copper, low zinc, uh, and we looked at response of wheat pea, and we also were looking at boron as well, a response uh, uh, to these micronutrients. And uh, we saw some uh, pattern here of response of, of P, a positive response of the P crop to zinc fertilization, although it wasn't statistically significant. But interestingly, what we did see here, and it was rather unexpected based on the extractable copper level, which was fairly high in this soil, but we did see a statistically significant positive response to copper fertilization of the wheat in this uh, heavy textured soil from southwestern uh, Saskatchewan. And in this particular case here, it seemed like the soil applications worked better than the foliar application. And maybe that had something to do with the timing of the foliar application. Uh, not sure about that. For chloride, uh, there is the potential for response of cereals in, in highly leached soils that have low extractable chloride levels in the soil. And that response may be associated with disease pressure in regions of the landscape, uh, depressional areas where we have water accumulating. Uh, that water, when it moves down through the profile, will leach that chloride to death because chloride is very mobile. It moves with water, just like nitrate. And also those areas in the landscape are areas, because of the uh, uh, extra moisture, are areas that we may see increased incidence of disease. And a few years back, uh, did a study where it looked at response of application of chloride as KCL on a landscape basis and saw that application of KCL increased the wheat yield in the highly leached depressions, but didn't have any influence on the upslope areas. And that was a wet year. And in a following dry year, there was no effect of the applied potash at all on the uh, yield of the wheat in either upslopes or low slopes. And this could be related to uh, seasonal year to year variations in the chloride content in the soil profile. So uh, we saw this landscape based response. Uh, nowadays, it, 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 we don't hear as much about uh, uh, chloride limitations and that might relate to the more widespread use of potash, particularly in the more moist areas uh, in recent years has, has probably reduced the incidence of chloride as a limitation. And one of the reasons why as well uh, related to chloride is crop removal of chloride is not really a significant factor. We find that nearly all of the chloride in a crop is in the straw. Very little is in the grain. And because nearly all of it remains in the straw, that means that it can be rather re effectively recycled uh, year after year. But year to year, we might, may find variations in chloride in the profile that relate to differences in the amount of net downward movement of water and how far downward in the profile, perhaps out of the reach of roots, that chloride has been moved. The final thing I'd like to just say a, a, a little bit about is a new study that we started this year uh, looking at rebuilding productivity of eroded knolls with phosphorus, zinc, copper, manure, and topsoil replacement. Uh, so this is a study here uh, conducted with RCBD, randomized 
complete block design, small plot, conducted on eroded knolls. Uh, you can see here that whitish color reflecting carbonates present there. It's a sandy texture, uh, low in available micronutrient, low in organic matter. There's our treatment there where we added our manure. Other treatment where we went in and we took uh, a topsoil from the low slope positions and moved it back up and placed it uh, on the surface of the soil. And we also had treatments where we added uh, uh, zinc and, and copper and phosphorus for fertilizer as well. And uh, we're just getting the data back from this study and uh, there's a, a poster uh, that, that describes a little bit more detail this study in the soils and crops workshop uh, uh, proceedings from, from this year. Uh, this shows the response of hard red spring wheat to our treatments on that eroded knoll and to just take you through the yield response uh, our, our, our grain, our straw yields, and the total amount of biomass that's produced, grain plus straw, in those treatments. So we got a little bit of a response to phosphorus fertilization there, but uh, I think maybe uh, zinc availability was perhaps holding us back a little bit there. It wasn't statistically significant. Uh, zinc alone didn't give us much response. Copper, we saw actually a trend towards a yield decrease associated with the application of copper alone. And this is something that we've seen in some of our other trials where the application of copper to a phosphorus deficient soil without any pea fertilizer actually has a negative effect on, on, on yield. So pointing to the importance of balanced fertility, certainly we see here where we add the micronutrients and the phosphorus together, that's where we're getting a, a higher mean yields. Also the cattle manure are giving us a, 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 a higher mean yield than the control, although not huge effect. Where we got our biggest impact on increasing yield was in the topsoil replacement compared to all of our other treatments and statistically significantly higher uh, grain and straw yield and total biomass yield. I think really important uh, reflecting the importance that and the fact that it's it's pretty hard to replace that topsoil with any kind of amendment because the topsoil also does some other good things that we were able to document as well in terms of increasing the infiltration rate, uh, improving the water storage. And I can say at this site that we had in 2020, uh, we only got four inches of growing season uh, precipitation. So it was really dry conditions. And uh, I think perhaps a part of the benefit that we saw from the topsoil replacement was the improvement in water relations that that, that, that added topsoil also added to that soil in addition to the uh, fertility benefit. So folks, I think, you know, general conclusion, the application of good 4R nutrient management principle for, for phosphorus and micronutrients certainly could benefit wheat, wheat production in Saskatchewan. And I'd, I'd like to thank the folks at Sask Wheat for their, their support and, and their opportunity uh, today to share some information and thoughts. So Dallas, I will conclude there and uh, open it. I think we can, we're going to have some questions. You bet. Thanks, Jeff. That was great. Uh, we do have uh, four questions here so far in the Q&A, so I'll read the first one out uh, just for the benefit of uh, those joining on the phone. Uh, Russell Fersh asks, products like Atlas XC, are they snake oil or do you feel they give benefit? Yeah, so I guess when it comes to, to, to additives that are going to have a huge effect on increasing the solubility and availability of phosphorus in our prairie soils. Uh, some of those that, that may be added or even biologicals can help enhance the availability of, of phosphorus by, uh, by promoting some additional root growth. And depending on the circumstances, that additional root growth may increase the uptake of, of, of phosphorus or it may, 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 may not have an effect. There really isn't anything that you can add to the soil that's going to have a huge effect on increasing the solubility of those phosphorus bearing minerals. Uh, bringing the pH closer to neutrality is going to increase the solubility of some of those calcium phosphate precipitates. Alternatively, if the soil was acidic, uh, bringing the pH up closer to neutrality can increase the availability. Crops like legumes can acidify the rhizosphere. They have these uh, relationships with AM fungi that can help uh, uh, improve the access of the crop to, to phosphorus. But I, I think we always have to be careful uh, not to expect miracles from something that we would add to the soil in, in a very small amount and expect it to have huge impacts on, on, on the availability of phosphorus. Great. 
Thank you. Um, there can next... be some benefits, but 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 again, uh, even sometimes we don't don't see consistent responses to pea fertilization when we might expect it, because uh, there's there's other factors that can come into play, like how the soil temperature affects the ability of phosphorus to move, how it affects the contribution of organic pea, and so on. So yeah, great. Uh, the next question here is uh, just curious as to what goal you would suggest a wheat slash canola slash lentil producer to build their soil levels uh, to in PPM on a soil analysis. And uh, he continues, is there a minimum PPM phosphorus level on a soil analysis that is required to promote certain bacteria growth that will prevent soil borne plant diseases? Yeah, the relationship between soil phosphorus fertility and soil borne diseases is not a clear one. And I don't think it's a real strong one either. Uh, but in terms of where you would want to have your, your kind of your phosphorus fertility, and in this case, the question was what about an extractable phosphorus level in PPM in the soil, uh, where you know, might, what might be your goal to be in general, just to have a decent background P fertility. I think you might be shooting for around, I might say, you know, 15 to 25 uh, PPM of uh, extractable phosphorus. Uh, in that top six inches as a background. Uh, when you get into single digits, uh, that's an indication you've got some pretty low inherent phosphorus fertility according to your extractable P assessment. And uh, as, as a consequence of that, you're gonna need to really pay attention to P placement because you don't have a lot of background P fertility for those roots to access unless they're close to that, that P fertilizer. And there have been studies and I'm thinking of one in Manitoba that showed actually, you know, the, 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 the crop growth and response to in, in general was better when you had, uh, you know, more than single digit uh, levels of, of P fertility in your soil. So like I say, you know, maybe around that 15, 20 PPM, I think that's kind of where you want to be. If you're up in the 40, you know, or 50 ppm, I think you're beyond the threshold. And I have to say, once you get up into those levels as well, you're starting to increase the risk of, 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 of export of significant amounts of phosphate off that field in runoff water that are potentially going to cause some, some concern related to the surface water quality. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what rate uh, was the soil tests where you saw responses? Okay, so that's a good. So, what rate were the soil tests? What levels were the soil test levels where we where we saw some some, some from large and significant responses uh, in PPM? Uh, those sites, uh, one of them was around eight PPM. Uh, the that was the one with the that was the site at Pilger. It was very low. Uh, another site, the Brown Chernozem, it was around. 12 to 14 ppm. So yeah, in that, but I have to say single digits, really, you, you've got a very high probability of seeing a response uh, to phosphorus fertilization under most uh, circumstances when you have extractable P levels in the single digits. Okay. Uh, Four is really low. Eight, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's, pretty, that, that's pretty low too. There's a pretty high probability. And there are charts out there, uh, and I use them in my class, that, that, that will show you specifically probabilities of responses based on P levels for different crops. Okay, great. Uh, Wheat's yep. pretty responsive to pea fertilization. Um, uh, as I showed in, in, in our trials, you know, where maybe canola tends to be a little bit more responsive, but we've also observed good responses of, of, of wheat as well to pea fertilization over the years. Okay. Uh, Kevin Hirsch uh, has the next question. How much topsoil was added to the eroded knolls? Uh, how much can you take from low areas without dropping production levels? Well, in this particular case, we added it was about 10 centimeter depth to the to the uh, of, uh, equivalent of topsoil in those plots. Uh, we're not measuring how much yield depression that would be associated with that with that removal. But I suspect in those areas of the landscape, and we did some work with a we did some modeling work. Uh, with a, a model that uh, was developed called the uh, simulated productivity loss by erosion. This was many years ago. And on those soils like you'd find in the depression 
and that had really thick A horizons and lots of accumulated nutrients from years and years of erosion. In fact, you could take off some of that topsoil with, without yield penalty. That was what the model was, was showing. And, and I think some of the other studies have shown that, that in those areas that have that large accumulation of eroded soils in those depressions, that, uh, that the yield penalty that you may experience by removing some of that soil is, uh, is, 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 is really fairly small, but that's not something that we are looking at in this, in this particular study. In fact, the topsoil replacement was an, was an add-on we decided to add in uh, based on, 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 on some, some work. A lot of really good work uh, has been done on this by Dr. David Lobb out of the University of Manitoba. Great. Uh, next question comes from Glenn Tate. Uh, most of the P data seems to be on spoon or shovel openers. Does mid-row banding add enough distance from the seed to make a difference? Uh, I guess in the case of, of, of mid-row banded phosphorus, and I've never worked specifically with, with that, but I've seen other research work and, and uh, uh, the mid-row banded, mid banded phosphorus is certainly a very good alternative to trying to, to cram more phosphorus in the seed row than really should be there and having a compromise uh, from that from, from reduced emergence and, and, and plant density, which may ultimately cause, cause problems in yield and weeds and, and so on. Uh, um, from a, from a starter standpoint, availability effect, uh, that mid-road banded phosphorus is gonna be, it's a long ways away from where the seed row is and where the roots of that germinating seedling are gonna be initially. So you're gonna wanna have some starter there in the seed row. But the phosphorus that's in that mid-row band uh, will be accessed by roots later on as they grow, particularly crops that are rapidly expanding their, their root system and have a, 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 a good root, root health and ability to move, move out and expand through the soil. Oil. And the unused phosphorus that's present in that in that band, if it's a mid-row band, for example, that's left behind, uh, uh, as our work has shown and others, uh, has good availability to a following crop in, in, in rotation. Ultimately, down the road, there will be some roots that, that will get close to that phosphorus and be able to, to, to utilize it. So it's kind of a way, if you look at putting some in the seed row and the rest in a band uh, and making sure you're not uh, compromised, you know, what you're... You, you can use you can use that additional band placement to put on some extra phosphorus uh, looking down the road to replace what's being removed in, in crop harvest over the years and not having to worry about trying to put it all in the seed row where it might cause some injury issues depending on what crop you're growing. Certainly for those folks that don't have that option of, uh, of, uh, of, of putting phosphorus in a separate band, as well as the seed row at the time of seeding, uh, they could put more phosphorus with their tolerant crops like wheat, the cereals that can tolerate more phosphorus in the seed row or in a pre-plant type of band as well, along with, with, with nitrogen uh, can be effective. Uh, I guess when you think about phosphorus, uh, you know, and where you wanna put it in the soil, you take a look at the root system. And uh, you think about the phosphorus uptake pattern, making sure you got phosphorus available early on, but that plant will also take up phosphorus later on in the season. So having that some phosphorus uh, placed in a separate band where the roots are gonna be a little bit later on, plus in the seed row is maybe a good all around scenario to have. Great. Uh, the next question comes from Kelly Beattie. Just want to clarify safe seed placed rates of P on your charts. Uh, were those numbers uh, kilograms per hectare uh, of actual P205 or kilograms yes. per hectare of MEP? They're actual P205. And they're actually very similar to what's in the uh, provincial guidelines. The Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture uh, guidelines for maximum safe rates in the seed row. And, and those maximum safe rates in the seed row that you see in provincial guidelines, they are typically given as actual nutrient rather than product. And then it's up for the grow up to the grower or the agronomist to do the conversion back to how many pounds per acre of P2O5 per acre does that translate into my monoammonium phosphate fertilizer product or my ammonium phosphate sulfate product. Okay, uh, the next question comes from Linda Gorham. Do humic acids have any effects? 
Uh, specifically, I would I, I would say from from my experience with humic acid, and I can I'm not talking so much here about phosphorus availability, but but we did do a trial uh, with a forage grass uh, where we did see some trend towards a higher yield from humic acid placed in the seed row with a forage seed grass seeded on a salt affected soil. Uh, but it wasn't statistically significant at the 5% level. I've seen other published work where humic acids will uh, increase uh, root growth, kind of act to have, kind of have a, a hormonal effect on the plant, stimulating root growth. And that may be associated with uh, some observations of increased phosphorus uptake. Uh, I wouldn't expect, as I said before, for any type of, a, of an amendment uh, that doesn't contain phosphorus to have a, a huge effect on the uh, on the uptake of, of of phosphorus, but but in as much as some of these amendment, uh, amendments can improve soil conditions, may enhance root growth, uh, that can have a positive benefit on uptake of nutrients, especially immobile nutrients like phosphorus, where root growth is particularly important. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from an anonymous attendee. Uh, were there any field scale recommendations given from the study on amending the eroded knolls? Uh, we're just into the first year of that uh, study. So uh, we also worked with uh, peas as well as wheat on uh, eroded knoll. And uh, in the case of the pea, uh, we saw actually a, not a bad response from the zinc that was applied to the eroded knoll. And that maybe relates to the fact that uh, pulse crops uh, can, can be uh, responsive to uh, a micronutrient fertilization, site specific. Uh, we didn't see as much response of the pea to the topsoil replacement as we did with the wheat. And maybe that just reflects the ability of that pea to do a better job of getting nutrient out of soil that is, is low in fertility to begin with by virtue of its, of its rooting system. Um, so we're continuing this study on for another two years where we're going to follow up the residual effects of those amendments. Uh, it was a really dry year this year. We didn't see responses to some of those amendments, it, uh, maybe just because or statistically significant, because it was just a year with, where, where, where moisture was, was really a limiting factor. You go up to the top of a knoll in a really, really dry year. And yeah, that uh, that that uh, that that crop is is really limited uh, to a large degree in response to anything by lack of moisture. But I guess yeah, field scale. Uh, yeah, those are those th those are small plots we set up, uh, replicated small plots on the top of a knoll so that we could do appropriate statistical evaluation. Uh, Field scale, absolutely. I think that's probably a next step where you would do strip crowds of those treatments across a field where you had the ability to evaluate those effects on a number of knolls uh, on a landscape type, uh, type basis. But right now we just have the RCBD small plots on the, on the knolls. Okay, uh, next question is, what is the best application timing for a foliar application of micronutrients in wheat? Okay, yeah, and, 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 and I guess that, that varies depending on the micronutrient, but I'm, since this is wheat and, and, and uh, copper, uh, is, what, what our studies, what, what our uh, work was based on uh, for copper fertilization of zinc, where we got those responses that I showed you in that graph, we were applying the copper foliar application to wheat at around the flag leaf stage. And that seemed to work pretty good. Uh, next question is from Ryan Herring. Uh, if you have a zinc deficient soil and you're looking at topping it up to sufficient zinc levels in a phosphorus soil of around 8.0, would you have uh, to add more applied zinc to compensate for the tie up of zinc in the long run? Yeah, so that, and, and that's something I, 
I may I can't remember if I touched on that or not. I guess I did a little bit the other way around where I said application of copper to a and zinc we've observed to a phosphorus deficient soil uh, without any phosphor fertilization had a negative effect to yield. That's something that's fairly new that hadn't been documented before. Maybe not that common out there how many people would add micros but not phosphorus. But certainly the other way around where you're adding high rates of phosphorus to a soil that is deficient or marginally deficient in zinc for example can induce a fairly significant uh, zinc deficiency and, and, and give potential for a much better response to, 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 to added zinc and need for zinc in that system and, and to pay attention to it. So, I mean, I guess I would say, you know, fertilizing, I think, you know, a soil that's in the single digits uh, phosphorus with monoammonium phosphate and your zinc is, is, is marginal uh, or, 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 or lower. Yeah, you, I, I would say particularly you would want to add some zinc along with that phosphorus to make sure that you didn't end up with that phosphorus induced zinc deficiency because that's been I think very well documented over the years that high rates of phosphorus and the actual mechanism I'm not sure whether that's really been elucidated yet but 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 that high rate of phosphorus uh, can interfere with uh, the zinc availability the uptake it might even have something to do with the translocation of the zinc uh, uh, within the plant. So absolutely, phosphorus, zinc balance, very important to, to, to consider. Okay, great. And as I mentioned, we have uh, about four minutes left here and we have lots of questions left. So we'll get, as, get to as many as possible. Um, Wayne Truman has the next question. Jeff, what is your response to the use of Jumpstart on canola seed to aid in phosphorus availability? Yeah, so so Jumpstart is a, a, a phosphor. It contains a phosphorus solubilizing uh, fungi, Penicillium bolli, and uh, lots of research work conducted with Penicillium bolli over the years, which has shown uh, its effectiveness in in increasing phosphorus uptake. Uh, by uh, crops and uh, I think probably in terms of crops and where it was first established and perhaps maybe showing the greatest uh, beneficial effect on pulse crops, uh, but also then extended into uh, uh, canola and, and wheat. Uh, that increase in, in phosphorus uptake that, that is often observed in uh, the inoculated uh, crop has been related back to a potential effect of the fungi on uh, complexing calcium and increasing solubility of calcium phosphate minerals, including old fertilizer reaction products in prairie soils. And also, and this was something that we observed in one study that I was involved with, an increase in the growth of fine roots. And fine roots can be uh, important in ability of a crop to access uh, a phosphorus, uh, like, like, like canola. So I think uh, that, that these types of, of biologicals uh, certainly have potential benefit in enhancing phosphorus availability. Whether you see an actual yield response to it or not, well, it's kind of like uh, uh, pea fertilization. Uh, sometimes you don't see much response to pea fertilization, even in a soil that can test quite low uh, and maybe that may be related to the soil being warm and moist and there's lots of biological activity there's a, a good ability of the phosphorus to move so 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 you don't see that that response so so yeah i think those kinds of, of biological products like 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 the penicillium bolli have been established in terms of their ability to affect plant growth uh, that relates to uh, increased uh, phosphorus uptake whether that translates into a yield response in the field or not, there's some studies out there that have been published that show very little response in a number of trials and others that have. So it's like any biological product, any type of biological product is gonna really be greatly affected by the environmental conditions, more so than a chemical amendment like a, a fertilizer salt. Okay. Uh Bill Detweiler has a uh, question here. Does this info apply to Durham? Any differences? Yeah, I think I think fairly similar between uh, uh, you know spring wheat and 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 Durham. Uh, we've mainly worked with 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 spring wheat. I will say, and I, this this relates to 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 micronutrients, uh, in that there, we did observe a difference in the composition 
of organic acids in the root zone, the rhizosphere of durum wheat, compared to hard red spring wheat, which seem to be related or, or may be related to uh, a, a responsiveness of, of, or lack of responsiveness of durum to micronutrient fertilization compared to, to, to spring wheat. And I'd have to go back into the, the PhD thesis that was, that, that work was done in to get the details on that. But there, there are some differences between durum and spring wheat, uh, that, you know, some that, that, that may, but overall, I think, and particularly for phosphorus, um, I, I don't think there's anything that would be particularly noteworthy in terms of, of adjusting a, a recommendation uh, for one crop versus another. Although certainly considering that rooting system of the crop and how it affects the uh, uh, both the nutrient uh, uh, demand and, and also the potential supply is very important. And, and uh, that is actually built into one recommendation system, decision support system, the, the PRS crop caster. Okay, uh, so we're right up here at 12 o'clock. Uh, Jeff, do you have a few more minutes to answer some of these? Sure. Sure. Okay, well, we'll take about another uh, five to 10 minutes here. Just uh, cut me off when, uh, when you uh, need to go here. Uh, so um, Cam Goff has the next question. Uh, how would you compare seedbed placed phosphorus results to side banded? Uh, seed, seed placed to side banded, there's been a... a, a, a number of studies out there that have been done and, and, and com did comparisons of side banded versus a uh, seed placed. Uh, some of those studies have shown relatively little difference in terms of uh, response to, to, to the added phosphorus. I think uh, in some cases that difference in where there are differences in response that have been noted, uh, it, it may be related back to the uh, phosphorus fertility of the soil to begin with. Uh, there may be some advantage uh, under really low phosphorus availability conditions to have some phosphorus right there in the seed row for that early access. Also under conditions where the ability of that phosphorus to move in the soil may be limited by cold soil temperatures and where root growth is restricted, really dry, really wet. Having that phosphorus right in the seed row can, uh, I think, can, can, can be of, uh, of advantage. Uh, in terms of, of, of placement in, in a side band and, and in a seed row where there hasn't been much difference shown, uh, maybe a little bit higher phosphorus fertility, maybe a, a, a better mobility of the phosphorus overall in the soil has led to the fact that that phosphorus being a little bit further away in that side band uh, really didn't have a big effect. I know there's also some concerns about uh, in a side band placement, if you're putting on very high rates of nitrogen, uh, in that side band, along with the phosphorus, that can create root avoidance and that can affect uh, early supply of phosphorus as well. Um, you know, I, I just had a, a student, uh, oftentimes the effects aren't that great. And I just had a 492 student who did their thesis and compared side banded versus a seed row place phosphorus where they hand harvested in the field, the seed, band, the seed applied or seed row placed phosphorus was slightly superior in yield compared to the side band but the combine yield data, and this I think maybe had to do with the difference in maturity because the seed row placed uh, uh, wheat, the, the phosphorus that uh, was applied seed row, the wheat, uh, it showed earlier maturity, uh, um, uh, a little bit greater early season growth and, and, and uh, enhanced maturity. And I think maybe that came into play in the combine harvesting where there really wasn't any difference between the side band and the, and the seed row placed. So overall, there may be some differences that can be related to the soil conditions that exist, but overall, it seems like there's not a huge difference uh, uh, between, in, 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 in many cases uh, between the, the side banded and the seed row placed. And it depends on what you're putting in that seed row as well, like the nitrogen where at high rates, you can get that, that avoidance uh, of the roots uh, of, that, of, that, uh, uh, side, of that side banded uh, uh, area. Okay, uh, the next question is from Barry Reisner. Uh, what soil test levels would you see as a concern for copper, chlorine, and zinc? Oh boy, I guess it, it, it depends on the, on the crop uh, and the soil. And uh, I, I guess in the case of, of copper, you know, when you get down into that 0.4 ppm of extractable 
DTPA extractable copper, I'd say, you know, you're getting where there seems to be a pretty good likelihood of seeing a response uh, of say a cereal. Uh, similarly down in those levels, less than half, 0.5 and lower PPM of, of zinc. For the chloride levels in the profile, and we were looking at them in the profile, I, I can't remember, and I, I did the work myself back in the in '97. Um, I can't remember offhand, but that paper is in the Soils and Crops Workshop Proceedings uh, from 1997, and I think we've got the profile chloride levels in there uh, in those different slope positions where we did or did not see a response to the uh, added chloride in the spring wheat. Okay. I can't resent, remember the exact numbers. I'm trying to think if it was 20, 20 pounds per acre of chloride in the top 30 centimeters. I, I can't remember though. <laughs> I'd have to check. Okay. Uh, Garth Massey has a question. Do you expect any real yield differences between seed placed versus side banded P205 in wheat? Yeah, like I said, it's the, you can you can find some studies where one's where, where one's better than the than the other, uh, and it, it flip flops back and forth. Overall, I would say that, that that from what I've seen, as I said, the differences that I've I've seen in the literature uh, generally aren't 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 huge. Okay, uh, we'll take a couple more questions here, and then uh, I think we'll have to cut things off. Uh, so Bernie McLean says, "I apologize, I missed the start. Do you have any comments about newer homogeneous blends like micro essential products?" Uh, he lists a few there and uh, they are touted as having lower salt index, so potentially being able to safely seed place more. I'm simply looking for comments, not necessarily a recommendation. Yeah, uh, and we've done some work with the homogeneous, the combination uh, type, uh, type products that contain nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and sulfur. Uh, not so much with wheat because it's not particularly sensitive compared to other crops, but we work, for example, with canola and with uh, pulse crops. We have seen some evidence of, uh, of some uh, greater, slightly greater tolerances with the homogeneous or combination products compared to the, uh, the uh, a blend of equivalent analysis. Uh, I wouldn't say it was huge, but we did see we did see some 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 effects there, uh, some 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 slight increases in, in, in seed safety. How much it was variable uh, and I'd really be reluctant to put a, a percentage to to it. Okay, um, a couple more questions here. Luke, uh, and, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, Luke Degans. Um, if your only option for adding copper to wheat is through a foliar situation, what is the best crop stage? To wheat? Yeah. We, we, we never systematically evaluated crop stages for foliar application. The manufacturers, the distributors of the micronutrients have recommendations, and I think they're very good recommendations to follow. Uh, and with the, with, the, with the foliar applications that we did in our wheat trials, we just picked the one that was most commonly recommended or, or, or utilized and seemed to work best in previous studies, and that was a flag leaf application. But I would check just to see with the with, with the uh, distributor with the manufacturer, what they're also also recommending as as well. Okay. Uh, one more question here uh, from Sasquatch's own Haley Tatro. Uh, can you comment on the availability of phosphorus for fertilizers like Alpine uh, that is phosphate in uh, orthophosphate form uh, in the soil compared to a product like MAP? Yeah, so, so liquid phosphorus fertilizers are certainly a very good source. Uh, I wouldn't expect miracles from them in terms of enhanced availability. Uh, again, there's studies that have been done in Western Canada that showed relatively little difference in availability between the uh, uh, liquid phosphorus fertilizer form and the monoammonium phosphate when it was applied in the same placement uh, in the soil. Um, some other studies, however, have shown and uh, 
And I'm thinking here in particularly in Australia on calcareous soils where they were able to show that the liquid forms did have uh, some significant uh, advantage over the uh, over a granular map form. Uh, but overall, I would say for liquids in general, you know, don't expect miracles uh, in terms of, of, of enhanced uh, availability. I guess positionally, one of the one of the nice things about a liquid is the ability to kind of squirt it uh, off to the side and get that separation, uh, but still have it uh, you know close enough that it's going to be able to, uh, to to get to the the roots of that that germinating uh, germinating seedling. But but chemically recognize that you know uh, polyphosphates do hydrolyze uh, very rapidly to the orthoform following their addition to the soil. Once they're in the orthoform, uh, they behave similar to the ortho that comes from a granular uh, pea fertilizer like map. Okay, great. Well, I, I'm going to have to cut it off there as far as questions go. Uh, I apologize to everybody who uh, uh, we weren't get, able to get to, um, but we had some great uh, questions there. And uh, obviously, everybody was very uh, engaged with your uh, presentation today, Jeff. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to mention a couple things before we go here. Uh, so please register for our next webinar, which will be on April 20th at 11 a.m. Dr. Tyler Wist from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada uh, will be, um, uh, I'm just going to try to get that up here. And... Oh, there we are. Um, and so he's going to be uh, presenting on the impact of beneficial and pest insects in wheat. So there you have it on the screen. Uh, you can go to our website, saskwheat.ca to register right now. Uh, I'd also like to mention quickly that we have a podcast called Wheat Profit. Uh, our agronomy extension specialist, Haley Tatro, interviews experts on various agronomy and research topics. So please go to saskwheat.ca to listen to all of the episodes. We're going to have another one up here uh, in the next couple of days. And um, while you're there, register for the next Think Wheat session. Uh, so thank you again to everybody for attending today. Uh, thank you especially to Jeff for uh, the great presentation. And uh, if anybody uh, is interested uh, in watching this again, we will have it uh, up on the website within uh, the next couple of days here. So thank you again and uh, have a great day.